Remind us, Lord, our joy comes from you. We lift up all those we've been praying for this week, as well as those concerns we may not have shared out loud but carry in our hearts. God, help us now to set aside our worries and our fears so that we can be present with you in this time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let us turn our hearts to worship. Isaiah said that the Lord spoke to the king and said, As the sign of the Lord your God, let it be as deep as shoal or high as heaven. But when the king refused, God would not be stopped. 
Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child, and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. God loves us to know, even when we are not sure of ourselves. God loves us to experience God's presence, even when we think we can get more quiet on our own. God sends a sign to God's presence to us. All we need to do is keep our eyes open and look. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son and named him Jesus. We are like these candles, and the joy is slow, to proclaim the peace of a deep and everlasting joy. And today, at the presence of the Jesus of God, as a sign that no matter our circumstances, we know we are not alone. Let us pray. Eternal God of power and grace, who comes to us in surprising ways, an angel appearance. In defeat of enemies and in resurrection of the dead. Show us the face of Emmanuel in our time. Bring us from fear to all. We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Oh Christ, 
may it be so. A newborn baby can't do very much. They can't walk, they can't talk, they can't feed or clothe themselves. They need someone to help them do these things. I was thinking about this as I was preparing for today, about how much help a baby needs from other people just to stay alive. At the start of our scripture story today, we will read that the soon-to-be mother of Jesus, Mary, had a problem. She is going to give birth to baby Jesus soon, and she is not married. Not being married is a problem because when and where Mary lived, men were the people who were allowed to make money. It was very difficult for women to make money on their own. So it was going to be difficult for Mary to buy the things that she would need to raise baby Jesus. Plus, not being married, Mary would have less people to help her take care of baby Jesus. Things are starting to feel pretty scary for Mary, doesn't it? But then we will read in just a few minutes how God speaks to Joseph in a dream and tells Joseph to marry Mary and to help her to take care of and raise baby Jesus. Now, Joseph did not have to do what the Lord told him to do, but Joseph did. And because Joseph chose to do what God told him to do, both he and Mary were able to give baby Jesus all the things that he would need to stay alive. And because both Joseph and Mary did what God said, baby Jesus grew up to be adult Jesus. Today's story reminds us that even Jesus needed help. In the same way that Joseph was able to help Jesus, we can help others in the same way that Joseph did, by listening to God. As we pay attention to what God calls us to do, then we will know how God is calling us to help and care for those that are around us, and how we can share God's love, joy, peace, patience, forgiveness, and belonging with others. Repeat after me this prayer. Dear God, thank you for Mary and Joseph, who listened to you and were then able to help Jesus. Help us to do the same. Amen. We stand as we sing hymn number 250, Once in Royal David's City.
as your Holy Spirit spoke to Mary, the mother of our Lord, speak to us now through your word, that by hearing we too may receive faith and be strengthened to do your will. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 7. Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals, that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child, and shall bear a son, and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. We stand as we sing hymn number 220, Angels from the Realms of Glory. Becomes 
apparent that Mary is already pregnant and not by Joseph. So he plans on breaking off their engagement. But engagement isn't really our understanding of what engagement means. Today, if an engagement ends, it is painful, but no lawyers are involved. At the time of our story, the Jewish custom involved two steps in a typical marriage. What translated as engagement essentially means establishing a marriage contract, usually arranged by parents, and is a legal arrangement broken only by divorce. Stage two is celebrated by a marriage feast held up to a year later, after which the couple moves in with each other and begin their lives together. Joseph and Mary are in between these two stages. They've been contractually bound to each other, but may or may not even know each other very well yet. They haven't lived together and haven't had the opportunity to conceive a child together. So when, Mary, when Joseph discovers Mary is pregnant, he is likely shocked and disappointed, perhaps angered and without a doubt brokenhearted. <clears throat> Rather than expose her to public shame and perhaps public shunning or punishment, Joseph resolves to divorce Mary quietly pick up the broken pieces of his life and try to move on. Today's reading comes from Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Please stand for the reading of our scripture. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from his dream, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he had named him Jesus. May God bless the reading and the hearing of our scripture. You may be seated. Joseph's perspective on the situation changes after a visit from an angel who tells Joseph that this child is from God and that he should take Mary as his wife as planned. But before we get to that part of the story, let us first sit with Joseph's grief for a moment. Because it is grief he feels. This is not what he hoped for, not what he had dreamed of or planned or anticipated. It's not fair. He has done everything right. He has worked hard and planned for their life together. He had done his part. Now everything changes with the sudden and unwelcome news of Mary's unexpected and inexplicable pregnancy. In 
the blink of an eye, Joseph loses everything he had hoped for, planned for, and dreamed of. Feel familiar? I think of 2020 and 2021 as the years of bitter disappointments and broken dreams. My son was a senior in high school that spring of 2020 when the whole world shut down. His senior trip was canceled. His senior prom was canceled. Graduation, after being delayed a couple of times, finally happened with little fanfare outdoors in the heat of July with thunderstorms threatening. Whenever I considered visiting my parents in West Tennessee, it felt like a life and death decision. My father, who has severe heart issues, felt extremely vulnerable in my mind. Yet, his health made it feel that we should visit because we don't know how much more time we will have with him. Weddings were postponed and rescheduled with limited seating and often just immediate family. Sports seasons were cut short or eliminated. Unemployment reached de depression era rates at Shannondale where I also serve as a chaplain, people could not come and in and visit family members unless someone was on hospice, and even then, tough restrictions were in place. Instead, visits occurred through video calls or through windows. I told my son during this time not to get injured because I could not go to the ER with him. Since he skateboards, hikes, and climbs, this was a legitimate concern of mine. Houses of worship couldn't gather in person, and getting groceries and other supplies was complicated, not to mention the shortages. Of course, so much of that pales in comparison with the loss of nearly 300,000 lives in our country alone let alone the million and a half worldwide. No matter your feelings about masks and vaccines, we can agree that we are still recovering from the effects of COVID. So much loss and so much grief, so much that we at times don't even know we are grieving. It is what psychologists sometimes call ambiguous loss. Loss that doesn't make sense and has no clear beginning or end. Loss that provides few answers and is as unexpected and inexplicable as it is unfair. It is the kind of loss that feels omnipresent, but at the same time, hard to name or pinpoint. So the grief it causes sneaks up on us and surprises us, perhaps while driving and hearing of a loved Christmas carol, or when suddenly overcome by the blues while folding laundry, fixing the kitchen sink, or putting up a Christmas tree. Maybe you haven't even felt like putting up Christmas decorations this year. Compared to last year, I've heard that a lot. It feels that you are doing pretty well with all the usual and unusual challenges until suddenly you're not and all at once feel overwhelmed and you don't know There are about only two things you can do in this situation. The first is to name it. Grief isn't something to be ashamed of or denied. In fact, the more that you do that, the more power it has over you. We have
have good reason for grief. This has been a time of disappointments, small and large, and so, so many broken dreams. Naming that grief contains it, defines it. To pull it out from the shadows, to a place where you can see it as real, but perhaps not as overwhelming as it once seemed. The second thing we can do is to be prepared for joy once again. If not prepared, at least open. Open to the possibility that life, though difficult, hasn't ended. That loss and grief will not have the last word. And that joy, happiness, and courage are not yet exhausted. These two things, grieving and being open to joy, are just what this short, not that sweet, maybe unfamiliar Christmas story is about. Joseph grieves as he plans to end his engagement with Mary quietly. And then he is surprised by joy. An angel appears and greets him with the signature line of scripture signaling good news and revealing that hope is not lost. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Do not be afraid to raise this son as your own. Do not be afraid of the future. Do not be afraid to make plans again and dream and hope again. For God is with you. In fact, the name the angel commands Joseph to give his son is Jesus, which means God will save. Then the angel tells Joseph that this baby, conceived by the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, is Emmanuel. The promise that God is with us always. Truth be told, in Matthew's stark story, stripped of sentiments, we don't know if Joseph was reluctant in his obedience or thrilled to be part of God's plan. All we know is that he consents, does all the angel commands and plans and plays an essential part of the greatest story ever told. All he does is to name his grief and then be open to joy and possibility once more. Grief comes before joy in this story and in so much of our lives. But the joy, hope, and possibility that comes is, in the end, more powerful than the genuine grief we name because that joy is born of love. This is the symbol of the candle we lit this morning, love. God's love for each of us. The whole Christmas story tells not simply how much God loves us, but how far God was willing to go so that we would hear, understand, and believe that good news. A few years ago, there was a story told by Paul Harvey, a radio personality and storyteller, about a farmer who never went to church, even though his wife did regularly. One cold and blustery Christmas Eve, after his wife had left to go to the Christmas Eve service, he was comfortable by the fire reading when he heard a thud against the windows of their house. He looked out and saw sparrows trying to escape the cold, harsh wind, and attracted by the light and heat inside, were crashing into the house's windows. He covered the windows, hoping they would stop, but that didn't work. So 
So he decided to put on his glove, coat, and hat and go out and open the barn doors wide so that the birds could find sanctuary there. But they wouldn't come in. He put lights on, but they didn't come. He spread a trail of crackers, but they didn't follow. He tried to shoo them in, but that only frightened them more. If only, he thought, if only I could become a sparrow for a little while, I could lead them into the barn, into safety. At that moment, he realized what Christmas was all about. God's intention, determination, and action to do anything to make sure we know we are loved and to bring us into safety. The grief we feel is real. So also is the joy, for it is born of God's love. So grief, and then be open. Give voice to your loss, and then hear God's promise to be with you. Name your fear, and then hear the angelic message of courage. Because the birth of Jesus doesn't mean there is no more loss or grief or fear. Just that these things don't have the last word. As the angel said so long ago to Joseph, let me say them to you now. Do not fear, for God is with you now and always. Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy One, who astonishes us with surprising gifts, we pray for your church and for the people of faith in every language and belief that your wisdom will show us our common life and that all people may rejoice in what you create. Giver of the stars and planets, creator of rivers and oceans and creatures large and small, we pray for wisdom as we live on and with your earth. Power above all powers, we pray for the leaders of government in every nation, that they may have wisdom to choose what serves the common good. Lover of all creation, we pray for all those we too easily forget, those of your children who are poor or homeless or in prison, those who are sick or lonely or frightened, all who hunger for faith and hope. Care for them that they may be strengthened by your joy and your healing. Holy One, in whose community we thrive, we pray for those whom we share our daily lives, our families, friends, and neighbors, those with whom we work and play, those whose names we do not know who provide for us, that we may all be renewed in courage and nurtured in hope. Sustainer of your people, we give you thanks for the members of the body of Christ in every age and every place who by their witness bring us here today. Come to us in Christ, O God, that we who live in this world by faith may see that faith confirmed in the world to come through the risen one who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now let us prepare our hearts for communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. 
Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Mindful of the abundance we have received in Christ, we offer ourselves to the world. Will the usher please come? <clears throat> Holy God, we ask that you take these gifts we give back to you for the building of your kingdom. Amen.
let us continue with a great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to hear our and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you. And blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night that he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, and broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as one community, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is not just a United Methodist table. All are welcome to come and receive the elements. Those in the pews on the left, if you will come up first by the center aisle and return by the outside aisles. Diane, will you come?
please join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. God, we give today in thankfulness. You bless us with many gifts. You retrieve us from despair and fear. You visit us with surprising proclamations, and you intend for us to do things. We thank you for your steadfast love, for the sending signs of assurance, and for the gift of faith. Use our gifts to bring comfort and justice to those in need, reforming the ways of our world for the sake of a new life. We stand as we sing the closing hymn number 230, O Little Town of Bethlehem.